with us and takes us to this awesome coffee shop, Campos. You guys know that coffee shop? There's supposed to be one of the most famous baristas there. His name was James or something like that. So I go up to him, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to be really Aussie here, and I'm Bogan, you know, so I go up to him and I say, good day, mate. <laughs> and uh, everybody looks around, you know, in the coffee shop, they're looking at me, who's this, you know, guy who, you know, I'm acting like I'm Aussie, but I'm not. And so, you know, right off away, I'm, you know, and, and you know, today, even as I'm speaking, you know, I think you, do you understand my English? Is uh, uh, you know, um, I can't fake who I am. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have that, I don't have that beautiful, lovely, cute, uh, nasal, kind of slurry, you know, good I made, or how do you do that? I, but I tried that, but I couldn't, because that's not who I really am. Well, in spite of that, James gave me a good cup of espresso, and uh, it's only been two days here. But as I get to know each one of you, um, is that rain? Wow, this place is crazy, you know? Uh, it's like... <laughs> Sunny one day and rain the next. But um, so what I, what I wanted to really share with you t- tonight, and it's going to be a short weekend, you know, today and tomorrow and I'm gone. But, um, but I, as I get to know you, I'm seeing how God has already been shaping who you are, uniquely who you are. Um, in a way, not as an apology as much as I think I want to I let you know that maybe inadvertently or naturally, um, Korean's going to come out of me because uh, I'm more Korean than I am uh, uh, Western or American. My mom's American. I'll tell you that a little bit. But, but there is this part of me. And sometimes, you know, I know in a kind of we have also people who are from other uh, cultures and languages and ethnic groups here. So I don't want to have an inside joke, but I, I, I want to let you know that God, our God is a creator of cultures. So my Koreanness, my Americanness, your Aussiness, all of that is part of what we celebrate here tonight. Uh, we celebrate God who created unique people with different backgrounds. And as we do that, God transcends culture, though. And so Christ is not against culture. Christ is an underculture. But Christ embraces and makes all the cultures um, come to praise him and show a part of who God is. So we will celebrate that tonight. And I will uh, be sharing about what real, authentic, true faith is. Um, And it's going to be from the passage of Hebrew 11. But as that, uh, not only do I have a Korean cultural background, but I would like to tell you a little bit about my family. Um, um, Thank you, Tim, for not introducing me as the brother of Pastor John Kim, who came here two years ago. I normally don't go any place he preached before because two things. Number one, he's usually better looking than I am, and I get compared a lot with my brother. Do you get that, Tim? Yeah, so, like, you have, is he your older brother? <laughs> is he your younger brother? He's your younger brother? Oh, okay, so you and I have, so you have a more, like, a, a people all go around to James, right? I mean, they're like, oh, James, and then, oh, Tim, you know, kind of like that, right? <laughs> so that's what I get all the time. So uh, my brother was here two years ago, and I'm so happy you didn't introduce me to Pastor John Kim's brother, because brother, you know, I'm telling you. But anyhow, um, we are three preachers in our family. Uh, my dad's in the middle. Um, he's, uh, of course, you can tell he's an uh, older Korean man. And then if you look at my brother, what do you think? Do you think he has some Western features there a little bit? Uh, be honest, guys. And I, ain't, ain't I? I'm just Southern accent here. Ain't I more better looking than he is? Uh, well, I tell you what. At least you know that I'm the favorite son because I have a <laughs> robe of many colors there. But uh, yeah, my my brother's just bland. But I'm you know very colorful. Um, I'm the oldest of of three. Uh, my sister's not there. But um, I want to tell you a little bit of the background, starting from my father, because um, I think. You know, a lot of that we get, we, we, our lives are shaped by our significant others, and I think my dad's a very significant part of my life. I'll probably get to talk, talk to you a little bit more about my mother, too. But uh, 1950, Korea, of course, had the Korean War. My son's making a movie, or he's not the director or anything. He's just like an errand boy in that uh, movie company. But anyhow, about the Korean War. But it's, th- this is very, uh, very personal to us because it was during the Korean War that my father, who was 15 years old, 
um, school bombed. Um, fam he, his father died, and you know, single mom raising five kids, and uh, he was 15 years old. He met an American GI because he was working as a houseboy. Houseboy is like an errand boy. You know, they hired these, you know, um, like war orphan kids on the street. My dad was on the street, and American GIs took him in, and um, he was cleaning pup ten uh, the tents and the shining the GI shoes and things like that. Well, one of the GIs took a liking to him. And wanted to, he offered something that was unheard of. He said, would you like to go to America? This is during the war. And of course, every young Korean boy's dream was to leave that, you know, forsaken land. You know, his war, war devastation of the war was just all over. And so, Carl actually did that. He took my father, who was 15 years old, to America. He was a teacher. Carl Powers was a teacher before he was drafted in the American Army. And um, for 10 years, Carl Powers, who didn't have a lot of money, um, basically adopted my father, sent him to a private high school, boarding school, and then to a uh, Christian boarding school, and then to, on to university and grad school. For 10 years, Carl paid for my dad's tuition. He wasn't a Christian when he left Korea. Of course, he was a Buddhist slash shamanist, you know, ancestor worship person. He had uh, these kind of, I don't know how to say that in English, but it's called a pujok. You know, it's a thing that you wear that will, you know, keep the, 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 the ghosts away from you and things like that. Good luck, kind of a charm uh, written on his collar here. And, and, and so he got, he got to the States, but after a year at this school, he was so homesick, but he ac accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior as one of his roommates led him to the Lord. He wanted to be a politician before he left the country, but after he met Jesus decided to be a preacher. So, um, so you know, he never read the Bible before in Korea or, you know, so, and Korean, I mean, English wasn't his native tongue at all, so he was learning how to speak the language. All, he thought he spoke English really well, but all the English that he learned was from the American GIs, and, you know, they don't really use proper English, and so when he got to America and tried to use some of the language that the soldiers used, you know, everybody said, you can't use that, you can't use that, you can't use that. So anyhow, he had to throw out all the vocabulary that he learned from the, from the American GIs. So English wasn't his, you know, it wasn't an easy thing for him to preach. You know, I'm, I'm a little better. I have, I have some help because my mom's American, so I, you know, I, I heard a lot of English. But I grew up in Korea all the way up to high school, so I also see preaching like this in English is not as natural. It might look natural, but I'm really faking it. Um, but one of the, the first time my dad preached, he was in these hills of Tennessee. And so he went to, you know, one of those little country churches. And the pastor got up and said, you know, didn't, you know just like you, Tim, didn't have much to I introduce my dad to. So he had to make up some things like you did. And he says, um, Billy is here to speak for us today. Well, Billy is a model preacher. Well, my dad, you know, because... He was learning English. He always carried the Korean English concise dictionary. You know, it's just, your, your parents will know this. You know, it's just like they have it in their closet. If you look at it, they have these thick little Korean English concise dictionary. That's how they used to call it, concise dictionary. And so he looked it up. He, he had it with him. And he looked it up, and it said, model. He looked it up in the dictionary, and it said, a small imitation of a real thing. And he didn't know if this was a good thing or bad, you know, so, but the guy kept on going. He said, Billy is not only a model preacher, he's a warm preacher. So he looked up in the dictionary, W-A-R-M. What did warm mean? It said, not so hot. So uh, he really knew that this guy didn't really like him. Um, uh, that's supposed to be a joke, guys. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, so English and uh, American culture for me also was actually not my my, my natural, it's not my mother tongue. Now, my mom, no, no, you know, I have to use Korean every once in a while, so please um, bear with me and some of you. I'll try to not get, make it a private joke as much as possible. But in Korea, you know, they ask you, what's your, you know, what's your, what's your first language? And the way they ask you is, what is your mo kugo? That's how they, mo kugo is the Korean word for that. Well, I learned Chinese character in junior high. So I always used to say my mo kugo or my first language is Korean because I went to Korean elementary school, junior high, and high school. 
Well, I got to junior high and I learned the Chinese meaning behind mo gugo. It's omi mo nara guk marsumo. It means mother's country's language. Well, my mother's country's language is English, but my mo gugo is Korean. So I was really confused. You know, I mean, uh, so if you were to ask me what is my, uh, what would be my, um, you know, defining, defining uh, quality of my life all along. And I'll explain to you, you know, this is my family when I was young. Um, a beautiful mom, handsome father, and my brother John's not even there. I love this picture because he's not there. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> um, <laughs> he wasn't even born then, you know. Like, you know, we were planned, but he wasn't, you know. He was an accident. You know? <laughs> I, I love to rile my brother a little bit. But what a beautiful boy, don't you think so? I mean, just, ain't he cute, really? Don't you want to just pinch his cheeks? Cute little American baby there. Um, but, you know, uh, you know I, out of the three children, I think I had, as a child, if you, I don't know if that, that's a black and white picture, but I had the lightest color hair. I had blue eyes. If you look at it, it's kind of aqua green eyes, you know? Brother and sister both had Korean eyes. Uh, I, I'm the only one who got my mother's eyes. And... Um, so, you know, I was, but it was, you know, I mean, this is a blessing, don't you think? Good looking, you know, blue eyes, you know. And some of them, people would like to even get eyes like this or put in, uh, what is those, uh, those tinted um, the contact lenses and stuff like that. But I had a perfect life with one problem. My problem was that I was hekalyo. <laughs> and hekalyo, I'll give you the translation, means basically a confused identity. And... Um, the reason being was, I mean, I would get all these questions growing up. I, of course, my father's hometown is Suwon, which is a rural part of Korea. Now it's not anymore, but we were not a big city. It was a small farming village. And um, everybody would, when I would go out to play, when I was old enough to go outside of the house and play, like, there would be these questions all the time, just like you, you know, asking me questions. And they would always say, wow, what, what a cute American baby. And then I would speak Korean, and they say, Wow, you speak Korean. When did you come? I was born there. You know, they say, when did you come to Korea? You know, I'm 54 years old, I think, now. I'm trying to 50. Yeah. Am I 54? Yes. I'm 54 years old. You know, for 54 years, I lived in Korea. I mean, I was born there. You know, I went to college in the States, but other than that, I lived. But even today, people will ask me, When did you come to Korea? You know, usually people who ask me didn't live in Korea as much as I did. You know, I've been there 54 years, you know. And I get all these questions. Then they would ask me, like, you're not, you're not American? I said, no. Then they said, well, what are you? And I said, well, I'm Korean. And they said, no, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. You know, and I had to always explain who I am. And I, I'm confused who I am. So you know, that's my middle school picture. I don't know if it's, a, it's an old picture, so you can't really see. My nickname was Chigi, which means um, awkward misfit. You know, like you stand out. Um, I guess... I guess in Aussie, you call it the tall poppy seed syndrome. You know, if you stick out, you kind of cut it down. Um, but in Korea, it's the same thing. You know, you don't want to stick out. So, you know, I wanted to look as Korean as possible. I went to all Korean schools. Um, I, people would call me big nose. That's what they would call, like, foreigners, big nose. But, you know, my nose isn't any bigger than Tim's. You know, I mean, it's, like, almost the same size here. But because they call me big nose, which they call in Korean, like, banko, and I didn't like that. I didn't like to hear that word. It was very derogatory. And I, and I felt like, as a kid, you know, you always, if you go to school, you don't want to be the only kid with this funny-looking jacket, you know, or these funky old tennis shoes. You want to fit in, especially as you're, you know, growing up and going to school. Well, because kids would call me big nose, I thought, maybe if I could just make my nose a little flatter. So we would have ondo floors, these hard, you know, kind of rock-like you know, you sleep on the floor. You don't sleep in the bed. So we would sleep on the ondo floor, and, you know, I would go home. when uh, Particular days when I had heard banko a lot, big nose a lot, I'd go home, and I would lay, like, straight on the ground, just like this, you know. So my hope was that if my nose was flat, if my nose were to be flat, is it was or were, anyhow, anything, and this was flat, I would be not, I wouldn't stick out. I would do all kinds of things just to try to fit in. Well, the problem is, um, when I got to, like, high school age, and senior of high school, I thought maybe if I, I can grow out of this, my uniqueness, my, my confused identity, I would maybe eventually be able to overcome it. So, I'm so I went all the way through my high school 
in Korea, and I finally is I'm ready to graduate. But my mom and dad, you know, always told me that in college, when you go to college, you, you, you can go to the States. You know, you can go to college in the States. So, so this was like, oh my, I'm dating myself. In the late 70s, so 1978, I'm graduating from high school, ready to go to the States, to go to college now, my mom's country. And um, my dad called me in. And back then, you know, you didn't have fax, emails, or anything like that. So once you send your son off, you know, you're, like, you're not going to see him for at least four or five years. So my dad was going to tell me everything he wa- in life that he thought was important. So he, you know, is telling me, you know, if people, you know, always be grateful to people who give you things or help you. And he's telling me all these things about how to go to college because he went to college in America. And then, one, and then at the end, what he says was, listen, son. I've been there too, but if you go to college in America, the first thing that's going to hit you is those American girls. He said, they're cute. You know, Ipa. He said, he said. So I said, ooh, I got excited. I said, cute American girls. Yeah, that's what I want to go there too. But then he said something that kind of blew my, you know, just kind of confused me more. He said, but daddy is praying for you, son. I don't want you to marry or date American girls. And, you know, he's sending me to America, and I said, but I got really confused because the more I thought about it as he's talking, he said, I'm praying that you'll only marry a Korean. You know how these Korean old you know, parents are? You know, they don't marry anybody else but Korean. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to just kind of you know, tell dad, you know, you just, I wanted to tell him off, but I couldn't because you know, my dad's very like, austere, very authoritarian. You know, if you don't cooperate, he operates. You know, and um, he's like, he's, so I couldn't say anything, and I left the room then go look for my mom in the kitchen and I said mom did you know what dad just said he doesn't want me to even date American girls when I go to college and I said do you think do you do you agree with him I said what do you think and my mom looked at me usually he agrees she agrees with my dad a lot and then she says you better think twice I said why mom he says well if you marry whoever you marry you're gonna you know who who are you going to live with? I, at first, I didn't understand. And she meant, are you going to, you know, live with us? You know, I'm the oldest son. And she, that's Korean. That's how Koreanized my mom was. And she said, well, you're gonna, we're going to live together. Well, the girl that you're going to marry is going to be our uh, oldest daughter-in-law, and she's going to live with us. And don't you think you have to think about who's going to spend more time with her? Do you think your dad will spend more time with her or your mom will spend more time with her? She said, of course, mom. You, you and her, you have to get along. And she said, well, you, I think you better marry an American. Well, I got even more, more confused because now my dad wants a Korean you know, daughter-in-law. My mom wants an American daughter-in-law. What am I going to do? I just went away to college, and for four years, I couldn't date because every time I see an American girl, I would think about my dad, and oh, and I see a, a Korean girl every once in a while, you know, but then I would think about my mom because she wanted an American daughter. I got so frustrated about four years of not dating at college, I finally cried out to Jesus. I said, Lord, help me. You know, what am I going to do? You know, the only solution I can think of is maybe if I marry two, you know, if I have American. <laughs> you know, amazing. God is amazing. You know, God's so amazing. He helped me marry a Korean American. <laughs> A hyphenated Korean. Um, so she's here. Annie, you understand? I'll let, I'd like to introduce you, some of you. That's, uh, that's my uh, pride and joy and beauty, and thank you. Um, you want you to get to know her better because she's much better than I am. Because she is really, you know, she's what she is, actually. And you heard this before. You heard this a lot, right? My mom said this, I think, or somebody. She said she's a banana. And she's yellow on the outside but white on the inside. Well, my mom really liked her. I mean, my dad loved her because she, you know, guys, they just look on the outside. (laughs) But my mom saw her, talked to her, and she knows she's she's so American. She's much more American than I am. So, like, you know, her manners, her eating habits, or her, you know, her, her, her thinking, and everything is American. My mom says, you know, if you get a gift, you know, you don't, you know, what's on the outside is not important. What's on the inside? I said, yeah. So I said, mom, if she's a banana, what am I? And my mom says, well, you're an egg, you know, like you're white on the outside, yellow on the inside. So all along, um, I think I would say what defines who I am in this Korean-American bicultural living, and I think some of you might identify with this a little bit, is that we have to live in both worlds. Um, it, it's 
sometimes challenging. I mean, there are difficult choices like who are you going to marry? Um, what culture are you going to embrace? How are you, you going to embrace both of them at the same time? There are some cultural clashes that happens, and I think two of us had to struggle. Uh, we were coming through the airport in Korea. It was Kimpo at that time, now Sinchon. And so, without thinking, got just married, so I'm you know, proud as a peacock, bringing this beautiful bride back home. And I go in and I put out two passports. The guy who's stamping our passports, look at the passport without opening it. He looks at, one's a Korean passport, one's an American passport. He looks at us, one's a Korean, one's American. And so he talks to her in Korean, which she went to the States when she was eight years old, and she's just coming back to Korea. And so she's not very fluent in Korean at that time. Now she is, 27 years living in Korea. She's better than I am probably. But uh, so the guy asked her, Oh, you are interracially married. And my wife couldn't understand what that meant, so she looked at me. So I answered him, I said, yes, you know, we are interracially married. And then he says, oh, you speak Korean too. <laughs> but he opened the passport, and then he got confused. Because <laughs> on the Korean passport had a white guy, and on the, Korean pass on the American passport had the yellow girl. You know, and so it's like... Ah, so there, it's, we spent like 15 minutes explaining how we are like this, you know. It happens to us all the time. Confusion is part of, you know, that's just part of life for me. I thought it would end at our generation, you know, with my wife and I. You know, we're just like, she's American, I'm Korean, you know. Well, you know, we're just all messed up. Well, confusion can be hereditary. Did you know that? I have four beautiful children. Like I said, my oldest son... Is he handsome there? Anyhow, it's, not, it's too small. But anyhow, um, 25, 6 years old. He was born in 1990, so whatever, the 25, I guess. Anyhow, and then three daughters, Aaron, Sharon, Karen, Lauren. And um, so when Aaron was about 5 years old, I take him to my dad's church. And so all these older church ladies are, like, doting on him. You know, like, they're so happy. They're, like, they're like you know, like, like touching his hair or, you know, they're, like, buying him candy or giving him money. And then one of the ladies asked him, to my son, five years old, how's your American grandmother? In Korean, 미국 할머니 어때? How's your American grandmother? Well, my son's usually articulate, pretty articulate kid, but he got, he couldn't, he got stumped. He couldn't say anything. So like looking at me, asking for some help, and I couldn't help him because the lady's insisting, well, do you not understand what I'm asking you? I'm just asking, how is your American grandmother? Well, he couldn't answer because he was confused. You know why? You know, my mom and dad, who is his paternal grandparents, and his grandmother, is what ethnic person is she, do you think? She's American, right? But she lives in Korea. Well, his maternal grandmother is Korean, but she lives in America. <laughs> so for my son, five years old, when someone asks, how is your American grandmother? He doesn't know if they're talking about his American grandmother who lives in Korea or his Korean grandmother who lives in America. Which one is his American grandmother? Confusion goes down the generation. And our kids have to experience that too. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Hekalyo is the Korean word, right? Well, today I want to, and not only today, the next, I'm going to meet with you guys if you're here all three times. Heaven forbid, but I hope you are here. <laughs> I mean, you have to hear me three times. That's uh, hopefully will be something you can bear. But I'm going to share with you a, a, a one person's life. Of course, his longer story comes out in Exodus. But I want to share with you a condensed version of it. Actually, very insightful, much more, uh, what would I say, kind of, um, uh, I, it, it gives, th this passage in Hebrews is a more theological passage. Let's put it that way. It's teaching us what real faith is. You know, we have the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, you have the hope chapter in Romans 8. You have the faith chapter in Hebrews 11. I'm going to take, of course, I could take the whole passage. I'm just going to take one person, Hebrews 11, 23 through 27, the life of Moses. The reason I chose this particular person and this passage because this passage spoke to me some time ago. In my biculturalness, in my Korean Americanness, my two languages, caught between the two cultures and two languages, sometimes I wondered, what does faith speak? How does faith speak to my identity confusion? My conflict that I have. But I discovered somebody who God used that 
God used that mightily. And to me, this is a paradigm. This is a model. This is something that I think, you know, when you read scripture, I don't know about you, you know, I don't know how you read scripture, but, you know, actually, you know, Korean church grew fast, I think, because the way the old Korean Bible used to be. When the Korean Bible, the old, my grandparents' Bible, was like, it's written down like this, up and down, right? Yeah, have you ever seen those Korean uh, Bibles that was re- written up and down? The Western style, you know, which is from, what is this, from the left to right, you know? But in Korean old time, they read from right to left and up and down. This is how the Korean text used to be. Well, see, back then, you know, they used to say amen, amen when they were reading the Bible. Nowadays, we say no, no, no when we read the Bible. But whenever you read the Bible, you know, I think sometimes we read the Bible, and this is the attitude that comes. And usually it's me, though. I mean, I, I'm like this. I read the Bible, and I say, wow, this would be great for James. This would be great for David. You know, I think about other people who this word applies to. But I think when the word of God really makes a difference in our lives is when we can read a text and it's speaking directly to me. It's about me. God has prepared this message for me and I hopefully you. This particular story of Moses who was a classic example of someone who was hekalia. When we find out about how God was able to use his biculturalness his life of turmoil. But that exactly was what God used for making Moses one of the greatest leaders history has ever seen in faith. So I want to share with you about that. Uh, um, Maybe, do you guys mind reading together? Let's all read. Now, this is the ESV, so I know you have different Bibles, but let's kind of follow along from, from the screen. So if we can all read together... Um, let's just kind of, and it, today I'm just going to focus on this first, but uh, tomorrow morning at the, or not tomorrow afternoon, I guess when your uh, EM service is, I'll do the next two, three verses, and then tomorrow evening we'll do the last verse, which is 27. So we'll read the whole passage today, and we'll focus on verse 23. Shall we read together? Shija, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, Because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Short story, you know, almost the whole book of Exodus deals with the life of Moses. In fact, all the way from Exodus to Deuteronomy is the story of Moses. But Hebrews compacts that into four verses, amazingly. And... um, and, and, I, and, and, it, and it's about faith. Every, every, almost every verse starts with the word by faith. Now, as we were reading, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit because I want you to kind of mull over this a little bit. I was reading this passage um, in, in Almaty, Kazakhstan, when it hit me. I was going there because there were uh, Koreans, kids, young kids, who were missionary kids living in Almaty, Kazakhstan. They were going to Tinshan International School, which was an MK school. Started, and all the teachers were Westerners. There were no Korean teachers there. All the whole curriculum was in English. And here were our Korean MKs sent from Korea, followed their parents, just like some of you had to follow your parents to come to Australia. They followed their parents, plucked down into Almaty, Kazakhstan, thrown into an American or English speaking school. And in the community they lived, they were speaking Russian. So these kids had to learn Russian. When they wanted to buy something from the market, they had to speak English when they go to school. But at home to talk to mom and dad, they had to speak Korean. I saw those kids. The parents invited me because the school invited me and the parents did because these kids were almost like they were in trauma. They were, I mean, they were going through a lot of things. They were going through... Uh, 
they needed somebody to increase them. And I, I, you know, I wanted to find, you know, I, as I saw them, it was deja vu. I saw myself when I was little. Growing up, American mom, speaking English at home, going out to Korean schools, having to speak Korean there, and always coming home kind of, you know, who am I? Then God showed me this verse, these verses, and showed me the life of Moses, and I saw deja vu there. I saw the word, I saw Moses, I saw these kids. It was like kind of these movie scenes where there's overlap, you know, and I saw Moses' image overlap to the kids and then to me. And I'm seeing that in you guys. The reason being is this, you know, read through this, you know, talks about how he went through, I mean, it's about faith, but then he grew up, you know, he didn't want to be called Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want to be identified with the, with the dominant culture that he was thrown into. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God. Enjoying, but if you, there's, some, there's, some, there's some verses, and I'm going to point this out in a minute. If you look carefully, for instance, okay, let's go back to verse 23. By faith, it starts from the parents. What it says, they saw he was beautiful. I want you to look at some of these verse, the verbs. Verse 26, he was able to regard disgrace for Christ greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because he was looking ahead. Then verse 27, he, was, he didn't fear the king's anger. The parents didn't fear the king's anger, and he didn't. Why? He was able to persevere. Why? Because he saw him who is invisible. Do you see? Do you see in those short few verses the key noun faith connected to the key verb? What is it? See, saw, look. And God opened my eyes to understand where faith begins. Sometimes we, I think, have a cultural notion of what faith is. I mean, we grow up in the church and we say, oh, you know, in Korean, 믿음 좋다, someone has great faith. And what we mean by that is that person demonstrates some unusual behavior or quality of action. But I, I want to beg to differ a little bit from the Bible. And I want to talk to you about that. But I want to go maybe around just a roundabout way to do this. In verse 23, by faith, when Moses was born, the parents saw that he was a beautiful child and hid him for three months. Now, the word beautiful child um, was what kind of stuck in my kind of, you know, I, I couldn't swallow that. Because what, at that time, I think I had three children already. A fourth one wasn't, the fourth one was born a few, uh, few years after that, when I, when I first got focused on this. But we already had three kids, so... You know, as parents, you know, when you have a child, I mean, I mean, you're not objective, right? When you see your newborn child as parents, I mean, do you think your child is beautiful? Even though you have a deformed child to a mom or dad who's a parent of the child, you can't, you can't describe. It's love, you know, it's beautiful, is irregardless if you're the, your, your own child. You don't even have to have faith. I mean, non-believing parents Look at their children just like believing parents do. But why does verse 23 say, by faith Moses' parents saw that he was a beautiful child? So I was kind of, kind, of, kind of stumped there. So I looked it up, the Greek original, and it uses this phrase, beautiful child, astion to paideon. And that word comes from the word asteos. Asteos is a very... Rare word in the Greek. And sorry, I'm getting like really Greek with you guys, but um, I think you can take it. You guys are pretty, you know, sujun nopa in Korean. I don't know how to say that in English. You're pretty, you know, deep faith guys here. It looks like the way you're praising, I thought that was like powerful theological uh, songs that you were singing. But it only occurs twice in the whole New Testament. Now, to use the word beautiful, there was luo, uh, and there's other words that you can use that, that much more common, but for some reason, the writer of Hebrews chose the word asteos as this word that's translated as beautiful. And it didn't make sense to me. I mean, you don't have to have faith to see your child being beautiful. So there must have been some reason why 
the Hebrew, writer of Hebrews, chose that word. So I looked it up in other translations. The NIV said, doesn't say beautiful. NIV, the New International Version says, by faith, Moses' parents saw that he was no ordinary child. Or NLT says, they saw that God had given them an unusual child. Or the King James says, beautiful, just like the ESV does. There's only one other time the word asteos, or beautiful, unusual, no ordinary, comes out in the whole New Testament Greek. And it isn't found in Acts 7.20. Hebrews 11.23 says, By faith, Moses' parents saw that he was a beautiful or no ordinary child. But Acts 7.20 was also talking about Moses. And we can read that together, shall we? Shida. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. Same word, astios, is used here. Both times, talking about when Moses was born, with one difference. Hebrew said, who thought Moses was astios? Moses' parent. But Acts, borrowing, this is Luke who's writing Acts. Borrowing, I mean, this, he's recording uh, the preaching sermon of Stephen right before he was stoned. Stephen goes through the whole history of the Old Testament. In his short message, well, maybe long message, maybe like mine. But, um, and he says, two different authors, two different periods, but both describing Moses. And the word they use is very rare. Only used on Moses. Only used in these two instances. And the word is hard to translate. Unusual, no ordinary, proper, special these are the various uh, adverbs, adjectives that, that are used to, to try to translate this word. But here's my point. And God gave me this aha moment as I saw Scripture interpret Scripture. To me, the starting point, the basis of true faith is not some amazing feat you do for God, like maybe going out on the mission field and being martyred. Or like giving all that you have to build a church. Typically, we would think that person has a lot of faith. But not God. Biblical faith. What the Bible believes, what God is trying to teach, for us to have faith is what Moses' parents had when they saw him. But it isn't what Moses' parents, they, they themselves kind of created inside of them. I don't think so, because faith is really a gift, gift from God. But what it is, is Moses' parents was able to see Moses, their vision, their outlook, their worldview, if you please, was what God had. So to me, what faith is, is true biblical faith, is seeing life from God's perspective. Not human perspective. True faith is changing, if you please, your glasses. It's, it's, it's taking off your natural way of viewing things, or should I say uh, a humanistic worldview, uh, measuring things, giving value to things that most normal human beings, secular, would you, if I can use that word, or a humanistic way of valuing and viewing things. We are born with that kind of worldview. We see things from an outside kind of a perspective, just seeing things from the way it appears on the outside. But Moses' parents, for some, I, I would say it was God's gift, but some um, mysterious reason, they didn't take a humanistic view when Moses was born. And I want to explain to that, explain to you why that. If Moses' parents didn't see Moses as Dios, or see Moses with God's perspective, see Moses like God would see Moses, how would they, they see Moses? I think they would have seen him with this kind of glasses on. The glasses that um, um, Moses' parents would have normally 
seen, I would say, was a problem child. Because at least Moses had three kind of problems. Number one, he was hmm, conceived with terrible timing. Timing sucked. You know what I mean? I mean, he, Moses' parents, and from their perspective, Moses, they, they, uh, Moses' mom, Jacob, she got pregnant with Moses. Right? The pregnancy came just after when the law of the land changed. They, they already had two kids. They had a boy and a girl. They had Aaron and Miriam. And when the boy and the girl, when, they were, when, when Aaron was born, when their oldest son Aaron was born, it was okay. Hebrew families could have boys. But Pharaoh changed the law. There were too many Hebrews. There were too many of them. And so he changed the law and said, Any, no more boys from this offspring. They were scared that they would cause a revolt. So the law changed. If only Moses was born a couple of years earlier, he would have been not a problem. But right now, it was a problem. This, this pregnancy was a problem pregnancy. But let's say, the, okay, let's say the timing was off. Okay, you can't do much about that. It was God's doing. So it, as, as Moses' parents was going through the nine months of pregnancy, can you imagine what they would have prayed? The parents would have prayed. They could have, they could have only one prayer. What would that be? God, please give us a daughter. She can live. If this baby becomes a boy, if this baby's a boy, uh, he will have to die. And we can't bear that. God, we beg you, give us a daughter. Give us a daughter. Give us a daughter. And he came out as a boy. How disappointing would that have been? He had a problem. He was a problem child. From birth. I mean, no, even before birth. The timing was wrong. When he was born, he was born wrong sex. He should have been a girl. But not only that, I think maybe there was something else wrong. Perhaps I kind of, this is my own kind of speculation, but I think Moses had some kind of a, a handicap, disability. My guess is that he had some kind of a speech disability because later on, at 80 years old, God calls him back from the deserts of Midian, back to, God wanted Moses to go back to uh, Egypt so that he could face Pharaoh. But what does Moses give as an excuse? He says, I really can't talk, God. You, You know that, right? And so God says, yes, I know. I'll send Aaron with you. So even God recognized that he had a speech problem. Maybe it was a childhood problem. I don't know when when this happened. But anyhow, from a world's perspective, he was three strikes against him. Moses was a problem. Should not have been born. When my wife, um, we had, I told you, we have four kids. But um, my wife was pregnant with our fourth child. We didn't know that. We didn't plan it. So it was a a surprise joy for us. But... uh, she wanted. She went to the hospital. Actually, she didn't even tell me. She just wanted to find out for sure and went to the hospital and met the gynecologist. And he asked her how old she was. And she said, I'm well, quite old. And she said, how many kids do you have? I have three kids. And, and then he did the test. And then he came back and he said, oh, you're pregnant with your fourth child. Come back after a week. Uh, don't eat anything one week from today. Come back. And I'll just, the um, Korean word was, I said, I will, uh, we will have an abortion. My wife was so shocked. She came home, told me that story, and she was in tears. Because, you know, we realized the world that we're living in, not much different from the world that Moses' parents were living in. Because from Pharaoh's perspective, Hebrew boys that are being born was useless to society. They could easily have been euthanized, killed, aborted. But we live in the same world, don't we? Convenience trumps everything when it comes to a life that is unborn. Problems from human perspective, but from God's perspective, astios. No ordinary, special, beautiful created in God's image, even though 
he had all kinds of problems. To me, faith is really seeing how God sees. Seeing life that way, seeing ourselves that way. But you know, this world constantly bombards us with different messages, doesn't it? It gives us the world's perspective of what's good, what's valuable, what's beautiful, what's special. And tonight, I want to ask you from my own life and in your life, what message are you listening to? Is it faith or is it calculation? Is it faith or is it human invention? Is it faith or is it our own wisdom that we are listening to? Because I challenge you, God's gift of faith will change the way we see, first of all, ourselves. As we see differently, we will be able to see others differently. I want to tell you my own story, and this will be the, uh, uh, tonight I will close with this story, but when I was a child, I always asked my mom to read this one particular story. She had a book of Aesop's fables, and you know they have these little picture books with these uh, all these collection of Aesop's fables. My favorite one was the Ugly Duckling story. Do you know this story? Do you know this Ugly Duckling story? You know, there was, uh, in, uh, there was an egg. Uh, uh, um, um, a swan's egg was mistakenly put into a duck's nest. So when this swan was born, the white swan was born among these dark-colored, squanny-looking little ducks, ducklings. Well, as the duck grew, as this duck or swan that l- grew up in the duck's, you know, pond, growing up, what did the swan think? I'm so ugly, because in a duck's world, if you're not like a duck, you're ugly. So this beautiful white long neck swan grows up thinking, I'm ugly. I'm ugly. I want to be a duckling. I want to have flat nose, black hair, you know, squinty eyes. That's what this swan wanted to be. Sorry, guys. (laughs) Well, there's the ugly duckling. Um, I mean, I don't know. when That was, you know, just in my album, and I picked it out. But if you notice, you know, all the guys have squinty eyes, flat nose, and and I'm the only one who has the shirt off, like symbolizing I'm the white guy, <laughs> the white swan, <laughs> if you please. But, you know, I wanted to look like them. I didn't want to stand out. So I went to school all through 12 years of elementary, junior high, and high school wanting to fit in. But, you know, very frequently I was reminded, no matter how hard you tried, you're an ugly duckling. The message that I got, what I... the you know, the bombardment of words was, you're not good-looking or you're a problem or you shouldn't be here. Those are the messages that I got. Of course, at home, I was always loved. And faith of my parents were a gift to me. They knew and they were able to help me see that God made me unique and God made me special. But still, my life didn't have faith yet. So I didn't. I didn't fit in. I, I knew that, hey, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, you know, I didn't walk the snow in the snow barefooted for 10 miles to go to school. I didn't have a poor life. You know, it wasn't financial hardship or any kind of other kind of hardship. But I had a great family. I had a loving family. You know, I had well cared for. But still, deep inside of my heart, I didn't like who I was. I don't know if any of you had that kind of feeling at all. Well, so I go to Korean school, and uh, at Korean school, you know, you, you have to take, they don't have, they, nowadays they all have hot, you know, like cafeteria food. But when we would go to school, that's how a typical school lunch was. Um, your parents would know. I mean, have you seen those Korean, Korean lunch boxes like that? Those are called, we used to call them pento, that's a Japanese word, but it's uh, toshirak now is what they call it. But it's these like tin cans. And you can see, you know, they have rice in it, but um, that's really a nice, um, nice Korean uh, lunchbox because you have rice, there's some kimchi on one side, and then there's like a ham sausage or something like that, or sometimes it's a beef, changjorim, or something like that. Well, that, that would have been a very nice 
lunchbox. Now, a poor kid wouldn't bring that kind of lunchbox. They would still have rice. It's usually all barley rice, or we call it pong bodibab. And then they might have, they don't have any of the meat or the protein. It would just have like kong jaban. Anybody know kong jaban? You know kong jaban? You tried it? If For those who don't know what this is, a Korean, it, 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 it's a little chewy black bean, uh, like really hard back bean. The only way I can describe it, if you ever seen goat doo-doo, you know, when goat doos poops, you know, it's, it, it really looks just like that. It looks like little goat droppings, you know. It tastes like that too sometimes. So it's, but it's called poor folks food. So um, anyhow, so these poor kids will bring just kind of a very plain lunch. And then the rich kids will bring that kind of the nice white rice lunch. Well, so I'm like in fourth grade now. And it's my first, now up to third grade, you don't bring lunch to school because you're done before lunch. You go home. They had 60 kids in a classroom. And in one class, there were 120 kids. So one teacher has two shifts. So first group of 60 kids come, and they go home without lunch. And the next kids eat lunch at home and come and do the afternoon class. So for three years, you'd go to school like that. And on the fourth year, grade four, year four, you start bringing lunch boxes to school. So this is year four for me. You know, first time I'm taking lunch to school, all excited because, you know, for the first three years of school, you didn't take any lunch. You'd only take it once a year when you go on like an outing, sopung we call it, and then you would take these lunch. But so now in fourth grade, we're taking it every day. So the teacher says, okay, kids, starting tomorrow, you're going to bring lunch to school. You know, make sure your mom packs you a lunch every day for the, you know, next, uh, you know, for until we graduate from high school, we're going to do that. So, um... So I go home and I tell my mom, I say, Mom, Mom, my teacher said we're going to bring lunch. Can you get me a new lunchbox? So she goes to the Korean market, gets this tin can, and the next morning I wake up, and um, she's already got my lunch all ready, and she wrapped the lunchbox in a newspaper with a little, uh, like, a, like a rubber band around it, and she puts it in my bag, and, ooh, that day, I'm so excited. I'm singing as I go, or something like that. And so I'm going to school. I'm all excited. I'm ready to like, you know, like, oh, this is going to be fun. We're going to have lunch together. You know, I'm waiting for lunchtime. And all these kids, you know, the closer, you know, like first period bell rings and the kids say, ask, they start asking, what did you bring in your lunchbox? You know, what's your panchan? What's your side dishes? And some kids, you know, like, oh, they're so curious. And my mom said, don't open it until lunchtime. So I was a good, obedient son. So I didn't open my lunchbox. I'm curious. So lunchtime comes around. And then some of the kids said, hey, let's all sit in a circle. So we get in this big circle. And then we're going to have like lunchbox inspection. You know, like, well, it's like opening ceremonies at the Olympics. You know, like, it's you're like, you're like, like, you know, so everybody's going to check out your lunch and one kid's open. It, it is like an opening ceremony. You know, it's, it's very, imp- and later on I discovered this is a very critical moment in a life of a child in Korea because that's when your socioeconomic status is determined. You know, like, are you a popular kid? Are you a rich kid? Or are you a poor kid? You know, all this. So the first kid opens up and he has this nice lunch box. He got this fried egg on top and Wow, you should have seen him proud as a peacock, you know, and other kids are like wanting to sit right next to him, getting closer to him because they want to share. You share your panchan, you know, you share your side dishes when you eat there. A few kids sit around. So you, you, your popularity is really determined by what your mom put in your lunchbox. Second kid opens his lunchbox and it's goat droppings, you know, like this. And he's so embarrassed, he puts it in underneath the table, and he's like eating by himself, and he's no one around paying any attention to him. So each kid is opening their lunchbox one at a time, you know? And I start praying. These kids think, oh, yeah, he goes to church. His dad's a pastor. But they think I'm just praying for my meal. No, this is life and death for me, guys. So I'm praying, dear Jesus, I pray that, Jesus, I know you change water into wine in case my mom put kong jaban. Can you please make it to be chang jorim, you know? And I'm praying. And then I open my lunch. Box and you know what my mom put in my lunch? <laughs> Ham and cheese sandwich. Guys, oh my, you're laughing at my painful moment. I can't believe you're laughing at me, but I'm glad you are because you're with me here. But you know, when I saw my lunch box had ham and cheese sandwich in it, today I think back and I said, Oh, bless my mom. She really loved me. You know, I love ham and cheese sandwich. I still do. And my mom, you know, she's an American mom. What can she do? You know, what do you pack your son? Uh, if you're an American mom, what do you pack? You pack sandwiches. So my mom basically 
thought my son loves ham and cheese sandwiches. That's what I always had lunch at school when I went to school. So she put in ham and cheese sandwich. Well, you should have seen my friends. They have never seen ham and cheese. You know, this was 19, early 70s, you know. It, McDonald's didn't come into Suwon until 1990, you know. No, no sandwiches, no hamburger, nothing like that. So these kids, these Korean kids, flat-eyed kids, I mean, they saw my lunchbox open, and their eyes got bigger than mine. I mean, they're like... <laughs> and I'm lifting my... I wanted to be incognito, you know. I didn't want anybody to watch me eat this, so I'm picking this up. And 120 eyeballs were following this, you know, like... They all wanted to have a bite, but I couldn't eat it. Because at that moment, 10 years had passed in my life. Stairs, name calling. I tried to fit in so hard. But at that moment, with that sandwich opened up in my lunchbox, it was like a ton of bricks hitting me. Saying, Joey, no matter how hard you try, you can't change who you are. And I sure didn't like it. Because it was like a rush of that painful memories just kind of like overcame me. I couldn't eat that. I, I closed my lunchbox, threw it in my bag, and I just ran out of the classroom. I went home. Two periods left. I went home. As I was walking home, you know, I was like, I don't know, sad, angry, everything. All these like emotions like turmoiling inside of me. Now I look back and I, I, know, I know what that was, you know. It was my struggle against God. I was fighting. I was kicking. I was saying, God, you made a mistake. And I said, you know, I was trying to find to, someone to blame. You know, why, why this pain? And, and, and deep inside of me, you know, I thought, first of all, I wanted to, you know, I said, God, why, why am I here? Why do I have to go to this stupid school? You know, these kids, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have to feel this shame. But then I got angry at my parents. I said, God, they didn't even ask my permission to marry. You know, why did they? You know, I didn't want my American mom to marry a Korean dad. You know, if I could have to do it all over again. But, you know, ultimately, I was angry at God. Without faith, life as it hits you, you will get angry at God. Because you won't understand. You won't be able to see what he's doing in your life. When pain, hurt, sin comes into face-to-face -face in our lives, we get angry. We can't trust. We can't trust it. And I was throwing all I could at God. I said, God, you made a mistake. No, this isn't right. If you're a God, how come? Got home, threw my bag down, slammed my door, got onto my desk, and I started like, <laughs> <laughs> like I couldn't handle it anymore. My mom was doing laundry, and then she, you know, suddenly she heard this door slam. She knew it was my room, and so something, something maybe he fought at school. So she comes in, and she gets close to me, and as as she gets. I could, I could just, you know, kids have these radars, you know, they, they, they know like within six feet when mom comes around, they know mom's there. So before my mom even touched me, I just like, I did it, and I'm crying, I'm, I'm saying in Korean, say, mama, why sandwich is so Why did you put sandwich and ruin my life? And then he's like, I'm not going back to school. You know, like, like, and then my mom just kind of hugged me. And then she just let me cry it out. And then after a while, you know, and she said, Joey, I understand. <sighs> if there's anybody who understand my pain, it was my mom. In Suwon, there was only two bankos, only two big no's, my mom and myself. <laughs> and so when mom said, I understand, you know, I, I kind of, as a kid, I, I can't, still can't forget that day. I mean, it's so painful. And I said, Mom, why did you come to Korea? You know, why did you have to marry Dad? You know, why do I have to go to Korean school? Why, do I, why did you put that sandwich in my lunch? You know, why can't we go? Why can't I go to American school? I, all these things. The mom just kept on hugging me, and she says, You know, I need to tell you why I came to Korea. And so, Mom, that day, hugging this ten-year-old kid, crying his heart out told me 
something that changed my life. So they changed my glasses, the way I looked at myself. She said, you know, your daddy was a little kid when he went to America. And that's where he met Jesus. And that's where he met me. And both of us could have lived in America, much better place to live, but we chose to come to Korea. And the only reason we did that, Joey, I want you to understand, is because we met Jesus and we wanted to share that Jesus to your grandmother, your uncle, aunt, and your cousin. We came back to let them know Jesus loves them. But mommy wants to tell you this today, Joey. Jesus loves you just the way you are. I heard the story of Jesus from, you know, I went to Sunday school, you know, as young as, you know, like in my mom's womb, you know, Moteshina, you know, I was a little kid who always went to church. I knew the story of Jesus, but at the moment of my crisis, the deepest pain in my life, when I was so angry at God and I was so angry at myself and my parents, mom spoke gospel in my heart because that's what the gospel is. Jesus loves us while we were yet sinners. No, while we were yet enemies of God. We didn't do anything. We didn't search him out first. Jesus died on the cross to prove that he loved us first, even before we knew or we were going to believe in him. Jesus loves us just the way we are. But at a 10-year-old kid, that's what I needed to hear. I knew Jesus, I knew the story of Jesus, but that day my mom showed me how Jesus saw me. That was faith. The glasses Jesus was wearing, was he loved me this way. Chigi, Benko, Ainoku, all the things other people called me. No good, not valuable, no reason to really Consider you with much value or honor. But Jesus loves me. Nails didn't help hold him on the cross. It was love. That day on my mom's lap, I was able to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Because I knew that someone who could love me that much, as a little kid, really, really loved me. I didn't know a lot of things. I didn't know all the theological concepts, but I did know that Jesus really loved me. And he was a son of God. He's a living son of God. And that if he loves me, I didn't care what other people thought. Accepted Jesus as my personal Savior afterwards, after I prayed the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus to come into my life. And mom said something that I won't forget. She said, Jesus loves you so much, he's not going to leave you just the way you are. You know, that is the gospel. He loves us, but he doesn't leave us. He loves us just the way we are. He doesn't leave us just the way we are. I was so innocent. The next morning, I ran into the bathroom. My mom, after I prayed the sinner's prayer, and my mom told me that he's not going to leave me just the way I am. I went into the bathroom the next morning because I thought Jesus is going to change my life. I thought I was going to have now black eyes and squinty eyes and black hair and flat nose. But I looked in the mirror. Nothing changed. Oh, what's, what's, what's he going to change? So I go to school. I open my lunchbox. Ham and cheese sandwich did change to peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> Nothing on the outside really seemed to change. Kids still called my name. They still looked at my lunchbox. I was still different. People still asked the questions. But you know what? Faith changes lives. How does it change it? From the inside out. And so in this little 10-year-old kid's heart, something started to germinate. And it was, I, I can tell you, now I can look back and see that growth, but at first, I didn't even recognize it. But what it was, was I wasn't so angry at God anymore. Not only that, those who were calling me names, those who were always telling me that I didn't really belong, I felt like if they could only know that Jesus loved them just the way they are, that they wouldn't be so angry at me. And so my attitude started to change. I started to grow. I started to embrace and love those people who call me names. And by the time I graduated from high school, not only was I able to have an identity that allowed me to accept who I am, I was able to embrace those who were actually causing my pain. 
It was an amazing transformation I, I discovered in that short period of life. But I want to tell you and close with this. It's been quite, you've been such a great audience. I didn't fully understand, and I still don't, the amazing plan that God had for my life. Because I want to tell you something. I probably would not be here tonight speaking to you if I didn't go through that. I found that out at 25 years old when I first met my wife. I was in L.A. speaking to Korean-American young, young kids, teenagers. Come to me was the meeting at OMC, Oriental Mission Church. Up to that point, all I believed was Jesus loved me just the way I am. He loved me too much. He's not going to leave me that way. But what I thought was all those painful memories that I grew up in Korea, why I had to do that? Why my parents choose to live in Korea? I didn't understand that. Maybe it's just my luck. You know, I just had to grin and bear it. It's my chesu in Korean, you know. I had to just go through this. I didn't know what purpose that served. But when 25 years old, and I was speaking at this young, young chondosa, I was speaking at, at a big, big, 1,500 kids came, teenage kids, in L.A. in 1980. I shared my lunchbox story to them. And you should have seen what happened that night. Because it wasn't me, I know. I was just sharing my life, just that I'm like doing with you tonight. But something rang in the hearts of those Korean American teens who are going through the same thing, just reversed. So afterwards, like these kids, there was like gang members. They had these kids with these kind of really like dragging feet. They had, you know, earrings, nose rings, tongue rings, all kinds of rings. And these kids who were like from the streets, they were, I mean, this was the first youth meeting in L.A., a united youth meeting in L.A. of its type. And there were hundreds and hundreds of kids, just guys coming to check out the girls, you know. And, but they, they heard the gospel through my life story. And then, I, you know, it's like 150 or 200 kids came to accept Jesus as their personal savior. I took some of them back, some of the guys, and I started counseling and praying for them. And I said, what happened? He said, <laughs> they're, <crying. laughs> they're saying to me, you know, they, they were, first of all, kind of blown away that I spoke Korean, this white guy speaking Korean. And they said, your story is our story. I said, what do you mean? He said, our lunchbox. I said, oh, your mom put sandwich in your lunchbox too? No. She put everything in Korean. And I said, why? He said, kimchi, shikimchi, gongchi, meruchi. So we take these Korean side dishes to our school and the kids would say, ah, something died, you know. And they said, you know, ah, they said, do you think Jesus loves us? And I say, of course he does. He loves you just the way you are. And he's not going to give up on you. He loves you so much. He won't leave you just the way you are. Since 1985, 2015, 40 years, 30 years have passed. And not only in North America and in Australia, in Kazakhstan, in Moscow, God has used my life story to reach TCKs, third culture kids, bicultural kids, hyphenated Koreans, if you please, to learn that Jesus loves them just the way they are. But it's not just my story, is it? That's what Moses discovers when he's 80. 40 years, he's in the palace. And he's groomed to be a prince. As a prince of Egypt, he grows up just, you know, receiving the greatest of all education. But at 40, he has to leave all that behind because he kills somebody. Runs away to the desert. And for another 40 years, he's just... Cleaning, you know, cow dung, sheep dung, doing things that, what is my life coming to? If he, at 79 year old, said, God, you made a mistake. I'm sure Moses had said that several times. What am I doing here? Why did I have to be born like this? What? What's, what's, what's my life's purpose? But after he turned 80, God called him. And God sent him back. Let my people go. And at, like, at 80 years of age, Moses discovered that his 40 years in the palace, 40 years in the desert, was all for a purpose. Because he had to go back to the palace 
people who were so ingrained to the Egyptian culture for 400 years, he had to rescue them and lead a whole nation through the desert for the next 40 years. Talk about amazing preparation and plan. I discovered that in a small way. My pain was God's plan. And I dare to say, as I watch across the audience here, that God has a perfect, amazing plan for you. I don't understand why he chose your family out of all the millions of Korean families to pluck you out of Korea and plant you here in Sydney. I have no idea. I have no idea the hurt, pain, Difficulties, struggles, confusions that you have gone through or that you will still go through. But what I do know for sure, through the life of Moses, through my personal life, I can tell you one thing, is God never makes a mistake. Faith will accept that. Faith will be able to see that. Faith will change your vision. But it starts from your heart. God created you in his image for a special plan. He's still making you. He's molding you. Some of the process is going to be very, very tough. But he's not finished with you yet. He's making a masterpiece. And he wants you to be his trophy. It will take faith to embrace that and follow that path that God has led you. But it is believing, seeing that Jesus loves you just the way you are. Tim, you don't have to be James. <laughs> you can be Tim because God made you Tim. I don't have to be John. I just have to be Joseph that God had made. But faith is the process. Faith is the avenue. Faith is the glasses that will allow you and I to embrace who we are in God's grand plan. Shall we pray? I hope I didn't speak just words from my experience or my mouth. It is my prayer that the word of God, Hebrews 11.23, by faith, when Moses was born, the parents saw that he was a beautiful child and hid him for three months and was not afraid of the king's edict. I hope these words are God's words to stir faith in your own heart. And I pray that tonight, maybe some of you might say, Pastor Joseph, I've been to church all my life. Just like you when you were a little kid, you went to church all your life. But perhaps tonight, in a fresh way, in a new way, you are hearing the voice of Jesus whisper in your heart, I love you just the way you are. I love you. I created you. I love you, and I died on the cross for you. You might have heard it. You might have known it like I did in my head, but I wonder, do you embrace it in your heart? Do you really know what it means that someone will accept you no matter how bad you are, how wrong you've done, how many wrongs you've done, or whatever that happened in your life? Tonight, I pray that the living, resurrected voice of Jesus will resonate in your ears and in your heart and in your soul. Will you accept his invitation? If you're heavy burdened, if you are, if you are really so worn down from trying to live the life, your own life by yourself, trying to figure out everything on your own, this is a time to let go and let God in your heart, in your life, and trust him. S stop kicking against God's plan or thinking that he made a mistake or believing that if God was really, really loving, why am I hurting so much? This is a chance for you to look at your own life. Now, the praise team is going to lead us into some few songs before we close tonight, but before we sing those songs. I just want to, every, every eyes closed, every head bowed, I just want to ask if there's anybody here tonight, 
And only tonight I will do this. If there's anybody here tonight that says, Pastor Joseph, I, I want to accept. I want to I have that faith. I want to have that saving faith. I want to really believe. I want to trust Jesus enough with my life. I've never really made that step. I went to church several times, many times, may, all my life. But I want to really trust him and accept that Jesus loved me just the way I am. If you want to reach out to Jesus and say, I trust you, I believe you, I really want to give my life to you, if you'll raise your hands and put it down, I'll pray for you. Just every eye closed, every head bowed. I just want to see if there's anybody who wants to do that. Is there anybody here? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, thank you. Is there anybody else? Just raise it. Yes, I see your hands. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes, yes. Several of you have raised your hands. Thank you so much. You can put it down now. Is there anybody else? You know, even if there was one person here tonight, that's why God wanted me to come here. But there's several of you, and I know there's several other of you. Maybe you already made that decision, but maybe you're not living by faith. You're maybe trying to straddling the fence, trying to still figure out life on your own. This is the time to say, Jesus, I give you my all. We sang that a while ago, but I wonder if we really meant it. I want us to really pray tonight as we sing our last few songs. And I want to pray now for those who have raised their hands, and then the praise team is going to lead us. But I want to pray for you now. And all of you, if you can, just pray in your heart with me. I'll pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me, for us. Thank you, Lord, for not only dying on the cross and, and really loving us just the way we are, but for your vision and your hope to have that message come to us, to here, to us right now. Thank you for preserving the gospel for us and for continuing this, your, your, your word to spread, to reach every soul on this earth. Thank you for that the message has come to me and to all of us here tonight, those who have raised their hands. I just pray, Lord, that this day will be a turning point in their lives, that no longer they will have to try to figure out life on their own or to trust themselves. They can trust their life to you. We pray for those brothers and sisters who raise their hands. We pray that their raised hands will be a symbol of faith, of accepting of what your son has done on the cross. Forgive our sins, wash our sins, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil and help us, Lord, to live our remainder of our lives perfect in your will and in your plan. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.